Good afternoon. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we were uh, delivered an executive order uh, late last week relating to the restructuring of the Department of Public Safety into an agency of public safety. And um, as a way of uh, getting ourselves familiar with what an executive order is and does, and in particular what this one contains. Uh, we are going to spend a little time on that this afternoon. So we have with us Luke Martland. And um, Luke, I would love to have you take us through um, a little bit about what is an executive order and what, and what it does and what the legislative role is in that. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Luke Marland, Director of Ledge Council and Chief Counsel to the General Assembly. And as the Chair indicated, I'll give you some background today on how the House or the Senate could consider and either approve or disapprove an executive order from the governor. Uh, my colleague, Amr and Amr Jali, would will hopefully join us soon and she could give you more details on the specific executive order and walk through its uh, specific provisions with you. So I'll start out with the intro, uh, the background, if you will, and then hopefully she'll join us. She's in another committee right now and she can pick up the conversation and carry it forward. As always, if there's a question, please stop me. Um, I'll let the chair recognize questions as she thinks best, but I would encourage questions if anything I say is unclear. On January 14th, the governor submitted two executive orders to the House and to the Senate, and each would reorganize or change the functions of a different executive branch agency or department. The one you are considering would solidify or coordinate all law enforcement duties in a new agency of public safety. Now, pursuant to 3 VSA Chapter 41, the governor can propose changes in the organization or functions of executive branch agencies and departments pursuant to an executive order. And the procedure for the governor to do so is set forth in that chapter and more specifically in 3 VSA section 2002. And by the way, all the background I'm giving to you is also contained in the memo that I sent you and that is posted on the webpage. So pursuant to 3 VSA 2002, an EO proposing the reorganization must be submitted to both the House and the Senate on or before January 15th of each year. The proposed reorganization set forth in the executive order will then become effective unless disproved by resolution by either House of the General Assembly within 90 days or before final adjournment of that annual session, whichever comes first. And there's other provisions in this same chapter that deal with other things that aren't directly relevant to our discussion today. For example, how money is moved to follow the reorganization, terms of gubernatorial appointees and some other matters. Therefore, the process set forth in 3 VSA Chapter 41 is quite straightforward. Number one, the governor may issue an executive order that reorganizes executive branch departments or agencies. He has to submit that executive order before January 15th of each year. Number two, as I said, the EO can uh, propose changes. Number three, if either the House or the Senate passes a resolution within 90 days disapproving that proposed reorganization, it does not take effect. And number four, if neither body does so, then it does take effect. Now, as I set forth in the memo, when I walk through these individual executive orders, this has been in effect, this statute for approximately 50 years. It's been used multiple times by different administrations. It was used uh, previously by the Governor Scott administration, including in 2017. And I explained those executive orders and what happened to each one of them. So at this point, I'd pause and welcome any questions you have or guidance from the chair about what else you'd like me to discuss. Are there any questions? How? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Luke, for that overview. Uh, my question is, 
um, are we able to amend the executive order or to accept it as is or not to accept it? I think it's a straight up or down. In other words, I do not think you can amend it because it comes from the governor's office. It's his mm. executive order. So I do not think you can amend it. And I think it's uh, instead a decision whether you wish to approve it, in which case you do nothing, or disapprove it, in which case you would pass a resolution stating that. And by the way, if you decide to disapprove it, the resolution doesn't need to state why you disapprove it. It could, but all the House would need to do is pass a resolution saying it disapproves the executive order for whatever reason you think appropriate. I do not think you need to spell that out. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony. Go ahead, Peter. Oh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, Luke, uh, I'm sure you noticed this. Both of the uh, executive orders in my reading, um, which is probably why you spent so much time saying it has to be either, not both, because the language in each of them uh, makes it seem like both houses have to disapprove. And so what you're unequivocally saying is that's not right. I guess that's one observation. The other question perhaps for uh, a chairwoman uh, better, are we to discuss today just the one on public, uh, the proposal of an agency of public safety or both uh, representative uh, chairwoman? <laughs> So um, I think for today, we will focus on the one that's most directly in line with our committee jurisdiction, um, and that is public safety. And we will wait and see what the Fish, Wildlife, and Natural Resources Committee uh, does with the other executive order before we uh, spend time on that. And Representative Anthony, uh, yes, you are correct. And that is why I did stress those words and why I spent time in a footnote. Uh, both executive orders clearly state that the executive order needs to be disapproved by both bodies. That is incorrect. That is a false summary of applicable law. Instead, the statute clearly states that an executive order only needs to be disapproved by either body. And in fact, that is the procedure that has been followed for 50 years. So it is what the executive orders attempt to uh, imply or state is incorrect. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, and thank you Luke, for testifying today. Um, what is the operative part of the executive order? And by that, um, there's a number of whereas clauses here that make certain statements. Um, are those operative? Um, or do we just look at the now therefore clause at the very end of the executive order? That's a good question. I think the operative part is the now therefore clauses. And the whereas I always view as um, similar to legislative findings. It's an explanation or a background. But once again, either body could disapprove this EO for any reason it deems appropriate, whatever that is. Um, so you can look at the whole thing or only look at part of it, and then you make your decision as you think appropriate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Hey, Luke. And unlike a veto, simple majority, Overall. Yes, I'm almost positive about that. You should definitely check with the clerk, but I think it's a simple um, majority vote. But I would check with the clerk to make sure. Thank you. <laughs> so um, can you help me understand a little bit more about the timeline? What, uh, what constitutes 90 days, 90 calendar days, 90 legislative days? Um, because some of the, therefore, um, clause is dated for April 15th to be the, um, the day that certain changes happen. Uh, so when is 90 days up? April 14th. So um, I counted and then I had uh, four of my colleagues count because <laughs> I don't trust my ability to count. And we all ended up with April 14th. So 90 days is calendar days. 
Uh, we started on the 15th. It was filed on the 14th. We styled on the day after it was filed. And then we counted 90. We all ended up with April 14th. If we're all wrong, then it's, it's only one day difference. But we came to April 14th. So action would have to be completed uh, before April 14th. I appreciate you checking on that, given given our questioning of the um, accuracy of the third whereas clause. Other questions from committee members? All right, I am not seeing any questions. Um, so uh, I understand that Amarin is finishing up in another committee. Yeah, she's testifying in House Natural about the other executive order where we're splitting up duties. So I hope she'll be able to join you soon. Okay, uh, Mike Merwicki has a question. This is for, for you, Madam Chair. Uh, since we have a moment, I'm just wondering if you have any sense of a, of a timeline for us and who we need to hear from next and, and if you if you're taking suggestions for who we need to hear from i will always take suggestions um the workload of the committee this week was intentionally left open in the event that we need to take any testimony with respect to budget adjustment which has a tight timeline um and we'll talk about that again maybe in a moment here um, but uh, yes, we will take this up in short order and, um, and begin working our way through how the executive order envisions changes to the Department of Public Safety and uh, with particular look to how, um, how the changes proposed here impact some of the work that we did last year um, in our uh, criminal justice reform work. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and pardon me if this has already been sent out, but do we have documents from the administration which which explain these these moves? Uh, as far as I know, the only um, document that's been sent so far is this executive order, which you can find on our committee page under today's date. Thank if you. There's more background documentation. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, John Gannon. Thank you. Um, Luke, um, I was looking at the, the second whereas clause, um, which seems to be making a constitutional argument that both houses have to pass a resolution. Um, and I know you, you have a footnote in your, your memo that talks about the constitutionality of 3VSA section 201. 2001 and 2002, but um, am I reading that whereas clause correctly? That's how I interpreted it. It seems to clearly be their implication. Uh, and and um, they seem to want to have it both ways. I mean, in one way they're using this vehicle. Um, they don't have to, they could seek a bill to achieve these changes, but they're using this vehicle that is afforded to them to try to implement these changes. Uh, but then on the other hand, they seem to be misrepresenting part of the applicable law. And then they seem to be implying that the law that they are choosing to use may even have constitutional questions. So they seem to want to have it more than one way. It is an unusual statute. And I do think there uh, could be constitutional questions raised about it, but it has not been challenged. It's valid, it's on the books, it's been used for 50 years. So as of right now, it is a valid law. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and as you pointed out in your memo, um, Governor Scott has used this on multiple occasions um, in the past um, without challenging it on a constitutional basis. Um, before I get to Peter, Luke, in your review of um, of this executive order, did you happen to go back and look to see if the 2017 executive orders contained this same assertion? Yes, I did, and no, they do not. Um, I looked at them a few days ago, but I believe what they said 
at the end is unless uh, disapproved by the General Assembly pursuant to, and then they cited the statute. So that would seem a more accurate summary of the law. I don't believe they contain those introductory whereas clauses that Representative Gannon just highlighted. And the conclusion was different and, and did not state that uh, both bodies would need to disapprove. So the 2017 executive order seemed to be accurate and had different language than the, the current executive orders. Thank you. Peter Anthony. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Much as I'm intrigued at the thought of a constitutional collision, uh, I, I'm not sure that's our job, or at least I'm not up to it. Um, I, I guess I would pose this to you. Uh, this may be a naive question, but given that this is an administrative executive branch reorganization, where would we go, <laughs> so to say, for testimony? Uh, since the likely uh, people who pop into my mind uh, would immediately be accountable to the very proposer of the reorganization. Um, so I, I'm, I'm nonplussed, I guess. Uh, well, I think it's safe to assume that the different departments, departments of state government that are uh, that are mentioned here will all testify to the same effect that they support uh, the unification of these different uh, government functions into an agency. Um, but uh, as we know from work that we've done uh, with respect to the Department of Public Safety, there are many other entities uh, around the state uh, in, uh, in the judicial branch as well as uh, um, uh, interest groups who may want to weigh in with us about the details of this. Um, and so part of the reason for not diving into this immediately is that I think it would be helpful if, um, if other folks had an opportunity to digest uh, their reaction to the, to the proposal. And, um, and we will certainly call them in in the coming weeks to hear their reactions to it. If I may uh, footnote, I can tell you from sort of local uh, radio traffic, as it were, the dispatch uh, topic, um, which will be drawn in by the state police into a more centralized and consequently a billable, uh, as it happens, activity ha is somewhat controversial. Maybe I'm even soft, soft soaping it. It may be more than somewhat controversial. Thanks. We've been around that track a few times. So you're, uh, you're picking up some of the same chatter that we have heard in the past. Uh, Bob Hooper. The order also produced a, an explosion of employee conversation about what does this mean to me? And a lot of it is a little unclear. So there might be conversation that comes from people who are actually impacted being taken away from the people that they have been co-located and working with and now put someplace else. Yes, and I can certainly hope that when we ask the various departments to come in and testify that they will get into the granular level of the day-to-day -day functions of their departments and, uh, and make a case for why this makes more sense than the way they're organized currently. <clears throat> Any other questions from committee members? All right, Mark Higley, go ahead. So uh, Luke, maybe you can remember, but uh, uh, didn't the uh, Shumlin administration propose um, uh, a, a restructuring of the risk management division and and that, that required quite a bit of conversation from, you know, VSEA employees and others as well at the time. Is, am I correct in remembering that? I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. I think I can answer some of that question. Not only was it proposed by the Shumlin administration, but it was to outsource that particular function, which I think actually did end up happening, if I'm not in, mistaken. Uh, 
Thank Mark. you, Rob. All right. Um, are there any other questions for Luke? All right. Thank you so much, Luke. Thank you. And I'll try to make sure that Amrin can join you. That sounds great. We have a few minutes of uh, committee discussion here on uh, on responding to budget adjustment. Um, and so we will occupy ourselves until we see Amron in the waiting room. Thank you. Um, so last week we jumped right in and, uh, and assigned some folks to, uh, to be liaisons to the budget process. And um, today is Wednesday. I believe that the Appropriations Committee would like to have a yay or nay from us uh, by Friday or, uh, or Monday afternoon at the latest. Um, and so I guess I just want to ask folks, are you, are you getting what you need for information about whether there's a budget adjustment proposal in your section of the budget? And, um, and are there anything, any things being proposed in budget adjustment that uh, rise to the level of needing to take a little testimony here in the policy committee? Uh, so I think Rob's hand was up from before. So Mark? Yeah, so Madam Chair, I reached out to uh, Representative Harrison and Representative Townsend. Um, those are my two uh, links there in appropriations. Um, it, it appears to me that, uh, um, and I'm not real familiar with this, but there was some money set aside last year for reserve for the use of uh, space, uh, whether it's the Barry Auditorium and Barry Auditorium and other other buildings, and um, my understanding is that money is being drawn back, uh, probably probably to uh, go for other uses. So, you know, that would be something I would think that we would at least look at as far as you know uh, whether whether or not um, that that. Uh, an appropriate thing to have happen. Um, and then I guess the other issue was, uh, and again, I'm not real convinced of, of this, but there's a, I believe in the, in the budget adjustments, there's also a provision around body cams for DMV, liquor control folks and so on. So those are the two things that I was made aware of anyway. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, if you could, um shoot an email to me and to Andrea with a couple of suggestions of who could come in and testify to that, um, namely who, who has testified or who will testify in the Appropriations Committee um, and anyone else who may have an interest in weighing in on that. That would be helpful. Thanks for that report. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, Mark's right. Um, there are requests for funding for body cameras, um, for liquor control personnel, $15,000, um, fish and wildlife enforcement, $45,000, and motor vehicle law enforcement personnel, $138,000. Um, so those are fairly significant. Even more significant, um, and this information came from Representative Townsend, um, public safety is requesting um, training costs for S1119, which we passed last session, of $402,000 for the state and $1.4 million for municipalities. Um, so those are significant budget adjustments. Wow. All right, so it looks like we're gonna find some things to fill in our committee agenda later this week. Thank you for that. Uh, Bob Hooper. Um, with specific relation to the auditor's office, there's nothing in budget adjustment that we uh, would be dealing with. Nothing in budget adjustment period for the auditor's office. So that was my little area of interest. I talked to Kim, she verified that. Thank you. 
Um, Mark, your hand's still up. Did you have something else? No, okay. Uh, Peter Anthony. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I wanna thank Mark. I, I treated it as a local issue, uh, the mention of the Barry Auditorium. There are many local uh, communities that have offered uh, facilities for regional uh, application in the context of CARES, either backup medical sites, testing sites, inoculation sites, the auditorium's one of them. And I, like uh, Representative Higley, would be uh, rather disappointed if all of a sudden the locals had offered real estate and facilities uh, at the behest of the state, and then all of a sudden the money disappeared to support those facilities. So thank you very much for raising that. Okay. Other questions or reports on areas of budget adjustment? All right. Well, that's perfect timing because now we have Amarin in the waiting room and um, we will invite her in to talk about the executive order. Hi, Amarin. Hello. Thank you for zooming in from your last <laughs> committee meeting into this committee meeting. You're welcome. <laughs> if we were present in the state house, we would give you a moment to catch your breath after <laughs> Sprinting up the stairs. Right. Um, hopefully, you've had a moment to sort of reorient yourself to which executive order we're we're discussing right now. We had a good conversation with Luke Martland, um, and we would love to dive in a little bit to the operative parts of um, the executive order related to public safety. Perfect. So, does everyone? have access to the executive order and can do it on a yes a second it is up so. on our committee page and uh, hopefully folks can call it up okay I will note that I also submitted just a sort of truncated timeline document um, just to highlight the pertinent dates I believe Andrea also posted that it's a, sort of a quick reference to see what's going to be happening over the 18 months if this passes into effect. Thank you that's helpful. You're welcome so I'm going to walk through the language of the executive order itself. Um, there this is an executive order to create the agency of public safety I'm going to cruise through the first couple pages of whereas is. Let me make sure I have the correct document. Okay. So starting on the second page, I think it's worth noting um, the, the goals that are stated here for the creation of the Agency of Public Safety, um, the goals of law enforcement and modernization and reform and optimal government e efficacy require a stronger and more direct alignment of state government law enforcement services, officer and executive training, recruitment and policy development and implementation. And um, the executive order states the state could improve and more efficiently deliver law enforcement and emergency response services to the public through the reorganization of the Department of Public Safety into a single agency of public safety. So that's just a little background on um, the stated purpose for creating the Agency of Public Safety. I'm sure once you hear more from the administration, you'll hear more background on that. Um, but in terms of the mechanics of what this executive order proposes to do, uh, starting towards the bottom of page two, uh, it's important to note that all duties, obligations, responsibilities, and authority, including contracts, grant agreements, service level agreements, and MOUs that are currently at the Department of Public Safety would be transferred to the Agency of Public Safety. Similarly, all financial assets and liabilities, including all appropriations associated with the positions um, at the Department of Public Safety would be transferred over to the Agency of Public Safety. And then lastly, all authorized positions, functions, equipment, supplies, and inventory is going to be changed over. This is, uh, you will see these phrases covered multiple times throughout the executive order as they talk about the shift of some of these entities over into the Agency of Public Safety. 
Moving on to page three, um, it's important to note that the commissioner and deputy commissioner positions of the Department of Public Safety will be abolished and that all the duties and responsibilities and authorities of those positions will be transferred into new positions of the secretary of the agency of public uh, safety and the deputy secretary. <clears throat> the agency of public safety shall be headed by the secretary who would be appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of the Senate. And then the secretary may appoint a deputy secretary with the approval of the governor. These changes would take effect April 15th, 2021. Uh, so this would be the first day that the executive order comes into effect if the House or Senate does not disapprove the executive order. On the lower half of page three and into page four, the executive order lays out what the structure of the agency of public safety would look like. There would be three departments. First, the Department of Fire Safety and Emergency Management, a Department of Law Enforcement, and then lastly, a Division of Support Services. Both the Department of Fire Safety and Emergency Management, as well as the Department of Law Enforcement, will have commissioners, which shall be appointed by the secretary with the approval of the governor. Um, and it's worth noting that Division of Support Services would report directly to the Deputy Secretary of the agency rather than have its own commissioner. Um, so for the Department of Fire Safety and Emergency Management, there would be uh, four divisions within that, Homeland Security and Emergency Management, Inspection Division, Fire Safety Division, and then the Technical Response Unit. And there are some additional uh, layers beneath listed there. For the Department of Law Enforcement, there would just be uh, two divisions, which is the Motor Vehicle Enforcement, which is presently in the Department of Motor Vehicles, and then the Vermont State Police. And then lastly, the Division of Support Services would encompass the Administrative Division, the Communications Division, including the E911 Board, um, PSAPs, Radio Technology Units, then a Fleet Services Division, a Forensic Lab Division, a Training Division, which would include the Criminal Justice Council, um, as well as the Fire Safety Training Council, and the State Fire and Police Training Facilities. And then the last part of the Support Services Division would be the Vermont Crime Information Center, um, including the Sex Offender Registry. Uh, I will also note that the, um, hold on, let me switch over briefly. I noted in the timeline, let me just scroll up here to make sure that I'm saying this correctly, um, that the the Medical Marijuana Board, which, um, excuse me, the Medical Marijuana Registry is currently in the Vermont Crime Information Center. Um, it is not referenced in the executive order. So it may be worth following up um, to see whether this plans on transitioning over to the Agency of Public Safety or whether it would in some way be moved over sooner into the Cannabis Control Board, which it's scheduled to on March 1st, 2022. Um, so that's just something we wanted to flag to make sure that the committee is aware. It's not mentioned in here. Presumably it would move over with the Vermont Crime Information Center. Um, I see a hand, so perhaps yes, I will stop. Yes, I suspect it <laughs> might be on that topic. So go ahead, John Gannon. Thank you. Um, you, you sort of answered my question with respect to the medical cannabis or marijuana dispensary. So that's an open question. Um, mm -hmm. the, the other thing I know, there, there seem to be appropriations tied into this executive order. I mean, there's promotions um, of two uh, commission heads to agency heads. Um, that's gonna cost money. Um, they're moving um, some law enforcement agencies from other departments um, to public safety. So that's gonna cost money, but I, I did ask um, Representative Townsend and appropriations that they're taking this up in the Budget Adjustment Act, um, and she indicated they were not. Um, so I, I'm just wondering where the funding is coming from, uh, given that much of this begins on April 15th of 2021. Um, have you heard or 
I have not heard, and I agree that that is a good question. Uh, the appropriations that are currently with these positions would transfer over, but anything that is beyond that, um, that is a good question to ask where that money is going to be coming from. Any other questions before I start back up again? Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so moving down to the bottom of page four, we're going to talk about the Criminal Justice Council. So you'll see there's the main shift of most of the Department of Public Safety into the Agency of Public Safety effective April 15th. You'll see that the Criminal Justice Council, however, has a later transition date of July 1st, 2021. Um, and again, all duties, obligations, and responsibilities and authority of the Criminal Justice Council under Title 20, uh, Chapter 151, including all contracts, grants, grant agreements, service level agreements, MOUs, all of that would be transferred over to the Agency of Public Safety. <clears throat> um, and as we discussed uh, higher up, this would also include the transfer of financial assets and liabilities, the transfer of position supplies, equipment, inventory. I see another hand, so I will pause. Go ahead, John. Thank you. Um, just so the committee understands, can you explain the, the current um, status of the Criminal Justice Council? Is it independent of public safety now? Is it basically an independent agency? Um, just so people understand what's happening um, under this executive order. Yes, uh, the Criminal Justice Council is independent. Its composition is uh, laid out within Title 20, Chapter 151. Um, the, it, it is a rather large um, council and the composition is statutorily laid out in terms of where the appointments come from. Um, and so for the bulk of this executive order, you have mostly the people who are already within the Department of Public Safety moving over to the um, Agency of Public Safety. The Criminal Justice Council is outside, the E911 board is outside, and the Motor Vehicle uh, enforcement division is outside. So those are the three entities that it would be moving in with the rest of the Department of Public Safety into this umbrella organization of an agency of public safety. So if the Criminal Justice Council is within the Department of Public Safety, does that mean that the Department of Public Safety can change the makeup of the council? Well, the, hmm, the makeup of the council is set by statute currently, and it does say that all duties, obligations, responsibilities, and authority of the council under Title 20 is transferred. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I had not thought about it in that aspect. And the reason for new members, the reason I mm -hmm. raise that is as people who were on the committee last year know, um, we spent a lot of time in S124 um, changing the makeup of the council so that it was made up of a majority of, pe of people who were members of the public and not related to law enforcement. Um, and we thought that was really important because they are judging people's professional conduct, uh, law enforcement professional conduct, and we wanted to make sure that it was independent and there were independent sets of eyes um, that were were reviewing professional conduct. So one of my concerns here is if all of a sudden it's now back under public safety, um, does that, do we lose the independence of that council? And I do think it would be worth asking as you hear testimony on this, what, um, what the plans are for that and how they view this statutory uh, the very prescriptive statutes that lay out the composition of the council. Um, and I will also look into that in the meantime. Thanks, Amron. You're welcome. Um, and thank you, John, for bringing that up. Um, that's an important um, consideration for this committee uh, because it, it was a major piece of work that we put a lot of time into and heard a lot of public testimony on uh, la just last fall. Uh, Peter Anthony. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I'm glad John raised that. I, I couldn't, uh, <clears throat> couldn't for the life of me figure out how an executive order could trump a specific statute uh, outlining composition and appointment powers for an independent council, but I'd like that confirmed by Amarin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> on a, on a, a rather different note, um, I, I, once upon a time, I was more involved with the executive branch and there was a mini cabinet that didn't, uh, composed of most of the commissioners uh, apart from or separate from uh, the core cabinet, um, uh, obviously composed of secretaries. Obviously this changes uh, what is the current composition of the um, uh, most, uh, uh, how would you say, um, smallest number of the cabinet of secretaries. Is there a place, maybe I should know this, is there a place which diagrams essentially the executive branch so that I could look at the current mini cabinet versus the uh, existing cabinet of secretaries and figure out what's going on aside from the money issue. It seems to me one of the intriguing things is the rearrangement of how the mini cabinet relates to the chief executive officer of the state. <clears throat> I think we could find that. I'm trying to think. I, the state workforce report might have a diagram of the state entities, but um, I can I can find out if there is a, a document that is updated to reflect current uh, agencies and departments. Any other questions before I keep going? Okay. <clears throat> so moving on to, down on to page five. Okay, so as we discussed, the Criminal Justice Council would be moved under the Agency of Public Safety as of July 1st, 2021. Um, and then as of November 15th, 2021, I will say this is an item that I noted on the timeline sheet that I gave you, the secretary um, of the Agency of Public Safety would report to the governor as well as the leadership of the General Assembly and the House and Senate Operations and Judiciary Committees on the status of the organizational transition and then recommend any legislative changes that are needed uh, to continue an orderly and efficient organizational transition. Moving on to the Vermont Enhanced 911 Board. <clears throat> this also would be uh, on a date as may be agreed by the General Assembly, but no later than July 1st, 2022. All duties, obligations, responsibilities, and authority of the Vermont Enhanced 911 Board under Title 30, Chapter 87, um, and applicable rules including contracts, grant agreements, service level agreements, and MOUs shall be transferred to the Agency of Public Safety in the uh, Division of Operations. <clears throat> Again, we have the same transfer of financial assets and liabilities, um, including appropriations associated with the positions transferred. Um, and moving on to page six. Again, positions, functions, equipment, supplies, and inventory would be transferred to the agency. <clears throat> the 911 board would have the administrative, technical, and legal assistance of the agency and may request the assistance of any executive branch agency. There is a section in here about um, that the executive director of the 911 board shall be appointed by the secretary of the agency um, and subject to the approval of the governor. Then the executive director may appoint officers, employees, agents, and consultants as he or she may deem necessary and prescribe their duties in consultation with the 911 board. This is uh, a statute, this is language that is mirrored in the current statutory. Uh, provisions for the 911 board. So they're just making sure that it gets included in here. Um, 
However, if you want any more information on what that looks like, that might be something you want to ask witnesses as they come in. And then lastly, the rules of the 911 board effective as of the date of the transfer will become uh, rules under the Agency of Public Safety. So that's for the 911 board. Then for motor vehicle enforcement officers, again, no later than July 1st, 2022, all duties, obligations, responsibilities of the certified law enforcement officers in the Department of Motor Vehicles Enforcement Division under Title 19 and 20, excuse me, Title 19 and 20, Title 23 will be transferred over to the Agency of Public Safety within the Department of Law Enforcement and then its own Division of Motor Vehicle Enforcement. Again, same language as above, financial assets and liabilities will be transferring over. Um, all authorized positions, functions, equipment, supplies, and inventory will be um, transferred over, including all sworn officers. <clears throat> and a chief executive officer, also called a director of the Department of Law Enforcement, um, shall be appointed by the secretary of the agency. I'm going to pause. I see a hand. Go ahead, John. So I, I just want to note, you know, having spent um, a lot of time looking at law enforcement retirement, um, this off session, um, aren't there collective bargaining agreements issues with respect to moving um, union employees from one agency to another? Because <clears throat> I, I know that the DMV law enforcement are unionized. So I'm just... Just want clarity on how that happens. I think that is a good question. I did go back and look at the executive order, which um, established the Agency of Digital Services. And I did see in there that there was a consultation with the Department of Human Resources over the transfer of positions. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether that should be included in here. Um, it may be worth hearing a bit more about whether there are additional steps that need to take place um, around the transition of classified service positions. Um, I am not sure. Thank you. You're welcome. I've got another question from Peter Anthony. Uh, I think, I'm sure John knows this. I, I just want to say it for sick of anybody who doesn't, as it turns out, the state police have their own bargaining unit. They're not part of the VSEA. So that, I don't know, there are, there are some issues, it seems to me, embedded in here that I'm not even fully aware of. I just know that these are separate contracts. Thank you. <clears throat> um... Okay, so I am now on page seven of the executive order. So again, it's worth noting that the rules of the Agency of Transportation and DMV relating to the responsibilities and duties of enforcement officers effective as of the date of the transfer shall become the rules of the Agency of Public Safety. Um, ra so rather than um, the adoption of new rules that would need to go through the rulemaking process, these would presumably, if this goes into effect, automatically be transferred over into the new agency. <clears throat> and so our, our last remaining items here, it's noted that the physical locations of the departments and divisions of the Agency of Public Safety will be determined by the Secretary of Public Safety um, with approval of the Secretary of Administration. So that may indicate that there might be some movement of physical locations. Um, and then there will be, um, if this executive order passes into effect, a, a study from the Agency of Public Safety that will look at the effectiveness 
efficiency and delivery of state public safety law enforcement services and shall report to the governor and the General Assembly on or before October 15th, 2022. And so this study and report would be about the feasibility and advisability of transferring the operations of uh, multiple branches of law enforcement, the Department of Fish and Wildlife Certified Law Enforcement Officers, the Department of Liquor and Lottery Certified Law Enforcement Officers, the Capitol Police, the Department of Labor relating to VOSHA, Project WorkSafe, and Passenger Tramway Safety. So that again, the report date on that is October 15th, 2022. And then uh, lastly, on or before November 15th, 2022, it sounds like again, the legislature and the governor will get a check-in from the secretary to uh, explain the status of the transition and recommend any legislative changes that are needed to uh, complete the transition. And the end of the executive order notes that the secretary of the agency shall become a member of the governor's cabinet, um, as well as such commissioners of the departments created uh, by law as the governor in his judgment shall appoint to be a member of the cabinet. So again, um, unless this executive order is disapproved by one, by either House of the General Assembly, either the House or the Senate, uh, this would take effect on April 15th, uh, 2021. So again, I, I sent you over a timeline which for me was helpful just to map out in my mind what the time frame is going to look like over the next 18 months. Um, but the more detailed information is in here in the executive order. Thank you, Amron. You're welcome. Committee members, any questions for Amron on what we have just gone through? All right, John Gannon. I, I just should note that it, it appears this executive order also creates two new policy committees, the Senate and House Committees <laughs> of Operations. I didn't know that those existed. <laughs> that an expansion or a contraction of our duties? <laughs> a bit of a role reversal. <clears throat> All right, any other questions from committee members? All right, I trust you will be in contact with me as you think about the various entities you would like to uh, have in front of us as we consider this. Um, and we will uh, we'll begin work on this in the coming weeks. Mike Merwicki. Mike, hit that unmute button again. Thanks. I just want to uh, amplify the concerns raised by John uh, about the the board that we st stood up and to see where um, well I'd like to hear again overall the rationale for what what the governor is proposing but especially that and if it if it actually undoes our hope that it would be a majority civilian uh, oversight on that board definitely Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just uh, throw out some uh, information that John probably knows and Peter raised. This this will have impact on retirement for a lot of these people because it's a hodgepodge of people that are in law enforcement, still in Plan F, in law enforcement on Plan C with a different step uh, proposal. And then there's the state cops, which are completely different. So it's going to be a hodgepodge of that to get worked out. And probably when it does get worked out, it'll cost us more money. Thank you. Good point. Um, any other questions from committee members or perspectives that you would like us to dig a little deep, more deeply into? Go ahead, Mark. 
So I've got an email out to uh, Representative Harrison in regards to that uh, kind of a clawback COVID money for, for rentals. Um, and maybe Hal can help me out on this. I heard your name mentioned. Uh, maybe that's, I, had, I, could, I couldn't find that amount as to what it was in the budget adjustment. So I've got that question in as well. But um, could it be possibly be through a BGS? And I'm, I'm asking how, just because I heard that you maybe were involved with that um, um, outfit last year. Um, I'm not, I'm not familiar with, with your question. I'm not understanding. You're asking if I was involved with the BGS um, issue or? Yeah, I believe Representative Harris, Harrison mentioned um, uh, that, that you were the uh, uh, go-to person through BGS last year. Am I mistaken? I believe so. Um, I wasn't involved as I am in, in, in this uh, session, so I didn't have any details to offer. I just participated as, as, the, as the committee. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm saying, I guess, is uh, I'll find out for sure who we should get in here to uh, talk about those, those particular provisions of, of clawback of COVID model. But I believe in through BG. Thanks, Mark. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Manager. I may be a little off the mark here, but I, I think it is, um, I think you're heading in the right direction there, uh, Mark, about BGS. I believe the money they're talking about, if I'm correct here, is the money that they were looking, that they had kind of allocated for the legislature. Um, potentially us coming back with a hybrid session. There was a lot of discussion around, well, one opening day at the Barry Auditorium, having a couple days worth of um, meetings there. And then I know that there had been a lot of robust conversation and around, uh, I believe us taking over one, the fifth floor of 133 State Street and some other spaces. And if it's my understanding, that money was allocated for fit up for those spaces, but it, it looks like um, we may not be using them potentially. Right, and I guess the confusing piece for me is I looked over the Budget Adjustment Act and I can't see anything in there in regards to, you know, any money specifically set aside for that or taken back from that. So we'll, we'll, we'll get it squared away. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate your hard work on that. All right, any other committee discussion, either with respect to the executive order or your budget adjustment assignments? All right, thank you, Amarin, for going through. Oh, Sam Lefebvre has a question. Go ahead, Sam. I was not given an assignment, which I understand why, but I'm just offering out if anyone needs help, um, I am willing to work. I very much appreciate that. And um, we will certainly try to create more opportunities for, um, for teamwork on, um, on these budget areas when we move into the big bill uh, so that our newer committee members can, uh, can jump in and, and get their feet wet with how to track um, the alignment of budget and policy questions. Um, any other questions for Amron before we let her go? All right, thank you so much. The timeline is particularly helpful to see how it is envisioned to all come together. And um, we, will, uh, we will need to have you back, I'm sure, as we begin to take some testimony from these departments. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, so committee, we are done with our agenda for the day. Um, I just want to invite any of you who are working on particular budget adjustment issues to, to shoot me and Andrea an email um, as soon as you 
come across something that you would like us to spend some more time on so that we can work on getting that scheduled for the gaps that we have in our committee later this week. Um, and let's see. Um, our agenda has been updated a couple of times. Um, we are back here in committee tomorrow morning um, to get an overview from Chris Rupi, who's at JFO, on sort of how our pension system works. And uh, we'll see if, uh, if he gets as deep into the weeds as, uh, as Bob Hooper was talking about a moment ago about the patchwork of different kinds of um, pension plans uh, in different law enforcement uh, divisions around the state. So, uh, so we'll do that tomorrow morning. And so if you wanna pop on a few minutes before, on uh, to chit chat and find out what everybody had for breakfast. We'll see you a few.